a small talk, but very important talk with a great leader, a great friend of mine. Uh, we actually, we just um, had a conversation about the mission of AMA. And I think me as, a, as an individual, as, as an individual, we share the same mission with his company. And it's, it, it's as simple as just changing the narrative of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the US. That's it. And what I found out he is a host of a great podcast, which is called uh, Latino, Executive Latino, The New Majority. It was like, hey, I need to talk to Pedro because he is actually working on the same mission. And if you guys remember what, I'm, what I say early in the morning is just unir fuerzas because probably we are doing the same across the country, but we don't connect. And this platform is specifically for that reason, to connect and amplify our voices in the U.S. Being said that, Pedro, thank you so much for coming. He's local. He's from Chicago. At least he uh, didn't take any flight from the East or West Coast. But thank you for coming all the way from All right, so I have a long intro that I will just get rid of it, and I will, I will ask you who you are to the audience. Thank you. First, all I want to say is, as everyone, nice to meet you. I'm Pedro Guerrero, I'm the publisher of Hispanic Executive, CEO of Guerrero Media, and the host of the majority of the podcast that this guy is referencing. Uh, originally from California, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, I heard there's some California people out here. <laughs> so, uh, if you know the Bay Area, I'm from Hayward, California. Yeah. Um, so that's where I grew up. Uh, with that for, for, for some time. My mom is Michoacan, so yeah. Oh, we got a lot of Michoacan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm, I'm from originally. Uh, got my education on the East Coast. Um, originally. Uh, trained to be a, an artist. That's a, a story for another day. Uh, now I run my own shop. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about the mission of this organization for the reasons that we just shared. Um, uh, ensuring that our stories are told the right way um, is something that, uh, frankly, there are uh, not enough voices out there championing that. So I think there's a, a great promotion of opportunity for all of us to be out there talking about. Uh, what we contribute to society. So I commend all of you for doing the inviting things. Yeah, thank you. Um, for the, the podcast, I think the message is the new majority, it's a podcast to share their narratives and find inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's something that we just uh, heard here with the previous conversation. These you individuals just in, inspired the whole room. And I think your podcast and, and your mission, the podcast is the same. I believe there are a lot of Latinos, professional Latinos, or Latinos in general, that are doing incredible work. But we don't know that, right? right? So um, tell, tell us more about your podcast and why do you come up with that idea and why you name it that way? Sure. Well, uh, where to begin? Um, the, the first is the name, the majority. Um, you know, we hear a lot of the, the the data, the narrative right now about Latinos are going to be the majority, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so for me, it's like, okay, um, I want to launch a podcast that's going to be tackling just that. And if we are truly, and this is going to be the case, if Latinos are truly the majority within our lifetime, why would I name it something derivative of the majority? Right? This is not the Latino majority, this is the new American majority. And so for me, it's planting that flag in what will become a reality of this country. And so that's why I made uh, that. Um, why am I doing it? Was that, yeah. was that <laughs> So what, one of the, the uh, most uh, resonant takeaways that I've heard from, uh, from speakers uh, was a gentleman named Austin Cleon. He's an artist. He, he wrote a book called Great Artists Borrow. Uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Oh no, actually, it's called Steal Like an Artist. That's the name of the book. It's quoting Picasso. He said that uh, good artists borrow ideas, great artists steal them. 
Um, and uh, it was a really interesting conversation about art, uh, et cetera. Uh, but what he said, um, the thing that drove him was that, you know, put something out in the world that inspires you, write the book that you want to read. And so for me, um, I wanted to put a podcast together that was the podcast that I would want to be listening to. So it's a very self-serving in many ways, but knowing that there aren't enough voices, enough stories, enough platforms, enough ideas out there that are talking to Latinos, I mean, there's so many, there's there's so much opportunity. So. That was really one of the reasons why I wanted to start it, is I wanted to put a podcast together that I would be interested in listening to. Um, you know, my background is obviously in media. I think it's um, there's there's so much opportunity in the media space for niche audiences that are Latinos. I like to tell people that you know, if, if you want to create a, a network for Latino fishermen, uh, you're going to find an audience. You want to create a network for uh, Latino skiers, what have you, you're going to find an audience. Why? Because all of the attributes of mainstream society are found within like, the Latino community. And I think that's one of the things that big media, in my opinion, doesn't really understand is that there really is so many micro communities and niche communities within Latinos, within Mexicanos, um, that I think is, is should be looked upon as just a phenomenal opportunity for business or creators or frankly uh, anyone that's interested in others that are like-minded so yeah yeah so um the board of MAA we were discussing about who is our target audience and I think Latinos we know our struggles where we came from but I think the message is no in my perspective it's not for only our community. I think we got to send a message to the other communities sure. outside of the Latino communities. That's what I think we should be approaching to. But how are yours? Yeah, that's a big uh, that's a big talking point. That's a big conversation. I think we risk sometimes just talking to ourselves. Um, we all understand it. We all get it. So I think the more that we can bring others into this conversation, I think the better. Um, so, you know, I, I sometimes feel conflicted about it. Um, part of me also believes that, well, you know what, let's, let's continue to have our conversation, let's continue to grow our connections, let's continue to doing the good work of uh, all these organizations, and at some point they're gonna have to wanna knock on our door and be a part of this conversation, it's just inevitable. So, um, but I think, uh, I think to your point, it's a smart move to bring others in it's a smart move for us to continue to have our conversations. I think it's also a smart move for us to be involved in other community conversations, right? Sort of uh, traditional mainstream conversations as well. So, um, so yeah, I, yeah. Okay. I think, that's I think we're on the same channel then. Um, <coughs> and following with your target audience and your podcast, yeah. how to earn respect as a Latino in our community? <coughs> uh, within our community, yeah. First, how to earn and, I, and I got that one on your uh, I think was your third episode on your first season. Then you were discussing this with um, this lady, I forgot her name, sorry, who promotes um, to vote in the US. And she was talking about this specific topic. Mm -hmm. They need to trust us, but how can we earn that respect? It's really difficult to say, like, I'm a Latino leader, but just because you say so, uh -huh. how, how do you earn Yeah. That? So, like, within the Latino community or within the broader community? I think with, within the Latino first. Yeah. Well, you know, I, that's that's a tough question. I mean, I think I can only uh, speak to it from experience, but I think it's starting, it starts with having uh, that respect for the self. Right? Do you consider yourself a leader? Do you consider yourself someone that's worthy of listening to, of talking to? Um, so I think it really, it has to be in here. Um, I think, you know, um, you, you hear a lot of conversations around imposter syndrome, especially within entrepreneurs. Uh, sometimes you hear in conversations uh, in, uh, you know, like, you know, professional circles that's something that like those perhaps are up against and it's not unique to us, by the way. Um, and, um, you know, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome all the time. 
And so I think that's something that we have to get over. Um, and uh, I, 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 I'm thinking through with the person that you listen to because I have it right at the tip of my tongue as well. But, you know, uh, this space that we inhabit, well, man, it's ours, right? Um, we worked hard, uh, we've advanced, uh, we, we on our merits, and um, I think we have to recognize that, and we have to have the ability to give ourselves a pat and back um, and be okay with our success and feel comfortable with it. And I think if you're able to do that, um, I think that starts manifesting itself in those interpersonal connections that you have with others. Um, so I think that's how I would talk about it, right? I mean, no one's going to give you respect if you don't have it for yourself first. So I think starting there is probably a good, a good place. I remember this morning, Chuy Garcia mentioned, okay, we're leaders, but we don't we don't create that fear outside of our community. So then they don't believe in the community because we don't feel them. That we're here and we have voices. Um, that just resonates with me, what you yes. just mentioned. Um, so Latinos will be a majority in the US. As a matter of fact, the data say so. And what does it mean to you and what challenges will, will we face? Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, Chewy's uh, position, I mean, he's coming from politics, the world of politics, and I think that's a, that's a, a, a very important uh, arena where Latinos have to flex, so to speak, but it's, it's complicated uh, for a variety of reasons, mainly that we know that we're not all a monolithic group. We don't all hold the same sort of political aspirations, opinions, et cetera, so there are a lot of differences. So my thinking, and I don't know what the answer is, is like, is there something that can really connect Latinos together across the political line, so to speak? Um, I don't think anybody has um, tapped into that. And I think that the parties uh, that, that are in power right now probably don't want that to happen because we know that if we're able to sort of crack that code, um, we're a force to be reckoned with. But um, for me, on, the, on, on your question, uh, what does that mean? Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, executives that we have been fortunate to connect with through Hispanic Executive or through the podcast um, often talk about um, this sort of idea that there's no better time to be a Latino. And you hear it often. And sometimes it's like, well, what does that mean? Uh, well, the numbers are there. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, uh, you know, the more I have these conversations and the more I think about it and the more I'm in the presence of people like you, um, I can't help to think of the burden of responsibility that we have as Latinos to step up and be. If that truly is the case, then every single person in this room has that responsibility upon themselves to lead for their families, certainly for their communities, for their companies and businesses, but for this country. Like that is absolutely required as Latinos, right? And, and that is one of the things that I, I think about when I think about the fact that we're going to be the new majority, that people, specifically Latinos, are constantly saying it's no better time to be a Latino. When I interview someone like Miguel Cardona, the Secretary of Education, who says that your biculturalism and your bilingualism is your superpower, oh shit, we all have it, excuse my language. <laughs> Why are we using it? Right? And so often I hear people, well, we have to build a coalition. We gotta get a lot of us together in the room. Yeah, we gotta do all of that. But you also have to lead yourself. I think that's an important thing. You have to lead yourself. Um, and so I think the more that we can start to tell each other that, and tell ourselves that, that I have a responsibility to lead, um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in that type of message. So um, I think that that is the, the type of effort that slowly but surely is going to start to have some sort of ripple effect and, and perhaps is going to catch up with the numbers. Um, so, yeah. So like I say, I don't want this to be a lecture. I want to be a engaged uh talk before i start next question please think about any questions you have for um, pedro and my last question to you is how can we start sharing our stories and contributions to the u.s probably podcast is one of them but i mean it's not that easy but what else yeah um well it's important to tell um you know goes without saying that social media uh, has provided everyone an opportunity to tell their story. I think 
maybe perhaps we don't look at it with that type of lens. Maybe we look at it just to comment on the polls or the latest politician or some sort. But I think, you know, thinking through the assets that you have at your disposal now, um, and back to this concept of the responsibility you have to lead, about thinking about perhaps how can I leverage what I have at my disposal to, talk, to start talking about my community, myself, or maybe even others. I think some of the things I really admire when I'm on social media is seeing other professionals promoting others. I know my friend Steven Wolfereda, Ben Cantos is doing that often. Um, you know, promoting other Latinos, uh, people that people, you know, people that others in his network should should recognize. So um, th there's many ways I think to take a, a start um, towards promoting him yourself. And, and I think one thing also could be psychological as well, which is um, this need to be humble and not to raise your hand or raise your head or, or say something for fear of being looked at as egotistical or boastful. Stop that. Um, everyone else is promoting themselves. If you're not promoting yourself, who will? So I think uh, that's something that I think is important to do and, and something that I saw from as well. Um, probably some medicine that I need to take. Person. Yeah. Um, a little bit of context here why Pedro is in this room. In 2020, early pandemic number one is how I call it. <laughs> I think we are on number six. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had this small community called Casapan. That's how I met Pedro to do a Twitter space. Just um, couple of leaders in the US, just we gather bi-weekly on a Zoom call just to yeah. chat about or you know, our stories. And then since then you are here and we share the same mission. And next panel is going to be related to that community because we're gonna talk about web three by the way. Okay. Which um the founder it's um part of the Casa Pan as well, he's actually from Chicago. Uh, but the thing is, if we don't start promoting our stories or just who we are out there, who else is gonna do it? Yeah. And then connection starts there, and then we start building this community that I mentioned, and unify as a whole unique community of Mexicans and Mexicans Americans in the US. I just wanted to it out because it, it's re it's related to what we are doing here and why are we why we are here and how we connect with these individuals who are doing incredible you know jobs because of the Latino community. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, one of the been the, the nice silver linings of uh, the pandemic was through Twitter of all of all platforms like Twitter to use for this year and a lot of other people. Yeah, when I told my wife what I was doing today is so one of the friends I met over Twitter. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> like, this is, that is the power of these tools, and they're available to all of us, is that you're able to connect with people that share similar interests. So. And I started with a different story. I, I started with my journey when I cycled from Alaska to Tijuana. That's right. And they were like, wait, what? Uh, did you? Alaska, like in San Diego, there is a, a town in San Diego? No, no, no. Alaska, the state. North Pole is called the city, and I went all the way, the, the, the coast, the Pacific coast to Tijuana on a three month trip over 2,700 mile trip. And then they were, they were asking me, I wanna know more about you. And I said, oh, let me introduce you to AMA. We are a community of Mexican Americans doing this, and we're promoting ourselves. There you go, we are here. All right, I'm gonna open up the mic for uh, questions. Sure. Um, anyone? Yeah, please. So every, um, thank you for being here today. Um, every time there is a census report, there is a sudden awakening by companies, um, by executives and other peoples of power that all of a sudden Latinos are here, Latinx are here, what are we gonna do? How do we cater them? Right. And there is this sense of urgency, a strategy, let's figure out that magic potion this time around. But then it fades away. Yeah. Then we don't see them anymore. Um, and how do you think that we can influence and 
and perhaps create a long-term strategy in those companies or those executives to continue to, you know, see us here. I hope it's, I mean, fear could be another option, <laughs> but um, in terms of, you know, we're heading to be the new majority and yet we don't hear anything else yet. Yeah, no, I, 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 I sense that, I see that, I also hear that question often. And for me, you know, I'm on a maybe kind of 24-7. Like it's, it's, not, it's, it's not every six years that I find my identity. I'm, I am who I am all the time. And so I think I'm biased uh, in my response and feelings to, towards that issue in that uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a creator. For me, I'd rather build it than wait for someone to build it. And so I think... That, that's my approach. It's like every six years you'll pay attention. Uh, meanwhile, I'll keep working. Um, so that, that's kind of been my attitude. But I would say what, what are the, you know, what platform do you have? Um, what is it that you can create that you can continue that? Right? Because for you, it's not something that comes by for six years. It's something that you're passionate with day in and day out. So um, that, that's, that's, that's my answer. Yeah. I think as a follow-up on that, because I get frustrated and fascinated, right, by numbers. And it's part of my census efforts in Colorado. And to our surprise, we did snatch a, a seat in the Senate from California to Colorado. So I'm sorry for that, right? Uh, but it was accidental. We just did our job. We went out and told people the importance of being part of the census. Because you're already here, and if the system or cannot see you, decisions are going to be made. And where I'm going with that is that um, I see so many people doing their own uh, thing, which I appreciate a lot. I'm a, I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, and I run my own show, right? But then it's like, I always think like, well, junto podemos más. And it's every probably four years, six years, where we have to not only recognize we have a network, but mobilize it, right? Because the success of Chicago you know, when they're talking here about elections, you know, success that we may have and need sometimes in Denver. And and we, we don't do that very well, <laughs> you know. We're still like, you know, we, we're supporting, but not really. And I'm sometimes says like, oh my God, like, we have a micro, cosmic, micro community as you're talking about that it's like, come on guys, we're, we're like, uh, ladies, we're like 10 of us. We should be able to do this. And sometimes there's something there that gets forgotten. That is that we should be able to account for this today. That's going to be able to replicate it. You know, we could do an Latino executives in Denver tomorrow. Sure. If you choose to help, right? Oh, this is it. You know, we could create a, a program like that in Colorado. Oh, you already have one. Just I connect you with. And I guess just to put, put a question there is like, what are your thoughts about like the network is there, the people is here, the leaders are already here, they're in this room, right? And outside of this room, what is your thoughts about how do we put them together sometimes for simple things as elections, as voting, as let's get generate a success so that we can actually be put it in the megaphone and say, hey, you see what did here? You can do it in your community. How do we get there? Yeah. I mean, there's no easy answer to that. Um, to me, you know, uh, what I what I do know is that I think all of us have to have almost a default mode of thinking, whereby when you see an opportunity, you have to think first of the Latinos, you know. Um, uh, that, that is one thing. Uh, I think about a conversation that I had with a uh, former CEO of AMC, Jerry Lopez, who, when talking about being on the corporate board, and you know, he used to uh, nominate people in his network who were best qualified, and and he started really honing in on uh, the best qualified Latinos who he can uh, nominate. So I think um, you know we are all aware of opportunities. We are all aware of um, what have you openings uh, to start thinking first. Well, what can I do to help the people that I'm with advance? First. I think that becomes a behavioral thing. I, I just met a representative from the uh, National um, Hispanic Corporate Council uh, outside, and, and I'm going to connect with them after. And I think because of the fact that we need to continue the effort to do um, 
cross association, cross organization, cross company collaboration. This space can get very uh, siloed and uh, it can get very territorial. Mm -hmm. And I understand why. Um, you know, people have sponsors they need to uh, acquire, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, the, the more that we can break past that and work together, I think the better. Um, so, you know. Thanks so much, Pedro. You, you really are an inspiration. The question is, um, where, where do you see Hispanic executive within five to seven years? And what's the impact on like the social issues of our country? So there is research that shows that those that are most concerned about climate change are Latinos, or Latinx people. 77% of Latino evangelicals actually are interested in climate change. Only 48% of African Americans and 28% of white evangelicals are interested in climate change. So how does Hispanic executive have an opportunity to engage us on those social issues that, that, are, that are very important to us in terms of our, our Latin American countries, our South American? And how do you see Hispanic executive impacting that particular change? Well, um I think there is, uh, so first of all, we focus primarily on executive profiles and, and, and really our, our, our uh, the reason we started that publication is that we thought, we thought, I thought, that there was a need to tell the stories of Latino success in a uh, top shelf way. Uh, and, and I think that was important to do. And so, yeah, what, where I am trying to move the brand slowly is to start to pull in uh, some of the thought leaders that we have in our network uh, for, for columnists to, to start tackling some of the issues that they care about. Um, but I think for Hispanic executive five years from now, I would say that I'd like to start moving into that direction a little bit more to be able to talk back to some of these uh, type, more topical type issues. So um, I, uh, just there's a, there's a wide opportunity for us to get there. But there's also a wide opportunity to have 15 other Hispanic executive type magazines, and that's a fact. Right. Um, and so we recently profiled uh, the publisher of Latino Leaders in, in, in Hispanic Executive because, uh, you know, he trailblazed the path before, before me. And uh, part of that um, yeah, I think mindset that we have to have where we're, um, what is that, crabs in a bucket, no somos a la gran, is that we're, you know, we're not pulling each other down, but rather we're trying to find ways to collaborate and lift each other up. I think uh, um, that's, um, you know, along those sort of behavioral lines. but. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think uh, at the end of the day, the, the most important thing that you're touching on and that the mission of this organization is touching on is that, uh, I, you know, I go back to a conversation I had with Ethan Vodkas, who's the head of the Hispanic uh, Scholarship Fund, and I asked him, what does he think is the most, in, like, the most impactful issue, the most critical issue for the Latino community? And I thought he was going to talk about education or something like that. And he said, it's the story that we tell ourselves up in New York. Right? <laughs> and, uh, the, the data that he threw out there, I wasn't aware of that. But, you know, clear. Uh, so are we telling ourselves the right narrative? <coughs> uh, do we understand who we are as a community? Do, uh, do we understand the issues that we care about? And I think that that quote that he really resonated with me, part of the reason why I wanted to start the podcast, but it's part of the reason why it keeps me going with Hispanic Executive is that, you know, we need to continue the work of putting narratives out there that are um, contributing um, to what's available to non-Latinos. I don't know if you Google search uh, how to engage with a Latino, Latino employee. I Google searched something like that recently. And it was pretty disturbing what was pulled up. It's just about landscape. Right? And it's like, uh, that might have been the search. It might have been something like it, but maybe it's changed. But to me, it's like there is such a deficit of info, such a deficit of narrative, of stories, um, that, uh, that is shocking to me. Right? And so, um, at the very least, what I could say that we're doing and that what this organization is doing is contributing to those algorithms so that they pull other other search results that start to paint a picture in the casual research, you know researcher that um, actually this can, this community has the things to talk about. Thank you. Great question. Anyone else? Yeah, please. 
Uh, so I'm on your listserv for Hispanic Executive, and I have listened to your podcast, so thank you for being here. It's thank an you. honor. Uh, I was wondering if you could just share three top shows that you would suggest people to start off with in terms of listening to your podcast, and why those in particular. Yeah, uh, listen to all of them down the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Listen to the very end. That's important. When do they drop off? It's actually, what's funny about that is um, the... That I forget. Um, I think it's um, I forget the KPIs. The amount of time that people spend listening to the whole thing and people drop off right around, I would say seventy five percent. And the best part of that podcast to me is the end. It's the end. It's when people talk about sort of how they would write the story of Latinos in America today. So if you're going to listen to it, maybe fast forward to the end and capture, <laughs> capture what they say. Um, but I think Bobby Herrera, the the first person we spoke to, I think was so incredibly inspiring. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gift of Struggle, which I uh, just resonated with uh, it's a leadership book by uh, episode one of season one. Uh, Dr. Cristina Mora is the last uh, episode of season one is also phenomenal. She wrote the book, um, The Making of Hispanics. She's a very smart uh, professor from UC Berkeley that talks about how this cohort was developed. Uh, from season two, um, the first one we got, Perdón, is just fantastic. Um, we have a couple of them coming up. Um, that are great. I, I, I'm also a political junkie, so I really enjoyed talking with Mike Madrid. He's the co-founder of the Lincoln Project. I think that is episode three or four. So hopefully enough there to capture any sort of interest. Thank you. Yeah, please. So, Pedro, have you ever thought about talking about the lack of Latino representation in corporate boards? Yeah, so that's, that's something that's, we that's, talked about. Yeah. I think that's one of the huge issues in our community. And it's not about diversity, it's about parity, right? And California is doing a great job because it's mandated now. But the rest of the states, in Illinois, for example, it's only, we are 22% of the community in Illinois and yeah. only 7% are on corporate boards. So right. it's a huge gap. Huge gap. Huge gap. And I think a lot of these corporate boards, when they think diversity, they don't really think Latino, which is, I think, what's in, uh, which is, uh, <coughs> I really like the, the sort of mandate of the Latino Corporate Directors Association that uh, diversity includes Latinos. Um, but yeah, there's a great opportunity and need and, uh, to, to have Latinos. It is something that we tackle often, because as you can imagine, a lot of uh, senior level leaders, that's sort of the next step in their career. Everyone wants to get on a corporate board. Um, so it's a, it's a conversation that happens regularly. And, uh, you know, I think uh, back to this question around um, having conversations outside of the room uh, uh, and with you know non Latinos. I think that is where sort of the corporate dynamic I think really starts to play more um, uh, have its relevancy. Um, there's a lot of great programs, a lot of great uh, associate. I'm, I'm by no means a corporate uh, board expert, um, so there's a lot of programs out there to, to carry you, to train you, to put you in touch with other professionals. But often, it comes down to who you know, right? And so I think uh, it's important to um, just meet more people and meet other people that are on corporate boards. And I know that some of the Latinos that I've met that are on corporate boards have been huge champions of others, uh, including myself. Um, so I think uh, big opportunity, big need. I just go all day. Individual you in the view, it's Maria Teresa Kumar. Yes, I was referring to Latino. Botola, Botola, she's fantastic. Yeah, that's the one that I recommend. I know nobody asked me that. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, hi, Bill. Um, I'm Maria Teresa Kumar. I'm a Latina and I'm an You've been in touch with a lot of executives. I don't know if you could share with us any of the efforts that they have done in terms of diversity and inclusion, but also female inclusion, because I'm in the financial arena and definitely uh, I was one in the you know, a meeting table, uh, one out of three. So anything that you can share best practices that you've seen executives have done for us to Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful um, um, we can have a whole conference on, on that uh, yesterday we had an ERG sort of exchange uh, virtual session that we do with Hispanic executive and our partner Robert Rodriguez on uh, how to best run an effective ERG um, I would say what I've seen 
is, uh, if I could summarize it in a you know, brief, is uh, twofold. One, if you're in a position of power, being someone that's sponsored, being someone that's engaged with the Latinos in the organization, uh, that's back to this concept of personal responsibility. That's a responsibility you have. And I think if you're someone that's looking for mentorship or someone that's looking to, to move up, to be completely and intentionally reaching out. Um, and then I would say if you're in these conversations and in these rooms and if you're passionate about gender, parity, et cetera, to, to, to call it out. Um, my good friend, Adela Cepeda, corporate director of Demo Harris, I was in the room with her once. Someone played a promo reel of some event, and there were no women that were showcased in the promo reel. Uh, that was the first thing she called out. And it, it, it just killed the group. But she said, there's no women in this. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, could have not said it. I think she's also someone of stature, very successful. So you know, you could say, it's easy for her to say, but you know, she said it. She could also not say it. Right? And so I said, you know, being intentional about it, reaching out, and then calling it like it is. When, when you see I love when they say people power. I know, men power. And I said, excuse me? People power. <laughs> right, right. Right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro. Uh, time is up. Um, yeah.